Hi, everybody. My name is Michaela Beyer, and today I am going to be interviewing Sammy Yaffa. Sammy Yaffa is best known as the bass player of Hanoi Rocks. However, he has recently embarked on a solo career, and he is just about to release a new album called Satan's Helpers, War Laser Eyes, and the Monkey Pig Circus. We are going to talk all about that and also delve into some memories he has from the past, which he's detailed in his book, The Road Ends. And I'm so happy that he's joining me today. Thanks so much for coming on, Sammy. Hey, how you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? Great, great. This is my dog, Papu. He <laughs> always seems to be very into being interviews. I don't know why. She's been <laughs> out all day and now she's in. Well, we're happy to have her. Hi, Papu. Yeah. Aww. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First fact, Sammy is a dog person. Yeah, and a cat person, and a parrot person, and a lizard person. A parrot and a lizard person? You've got parrots? Yeah, I like lizard. all animals. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Alrighty, if they want to join, uh, feel free to bring them on too. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, cool. So let's delve into the new album. Um, first, uh, the title. How did you choose that wonderful title? Well, yeah, it's it's a it's a mouthful, and it just uh, came out of my stupid head, I guess. You know, I was having a little bit of a party with my sister and my sister's two daughters and a couple of friends here in Spain, and you know, made a paella and drank too much wine and. I listened to we listened to my demos for the new album and, and I had a couple of songs kind of ready and it just popped in my head and it's it's kind of because of what's going on in the world you know that's pretty much it, it was a little after Russia invaded Ukraine and, and the whole world just seemed like a big ass mess and it's it's one of those things where the world just doesn't seem to get better it just keeps repeating its own stupid mistakes and uh nothing ever gets done so it was kind of a title of frustration i guess mm. will a lot of the songs reflect that <laughs> yeah yeah quite a few quite a few but then there's a couple of personal stories along the way and, and a couple of stories of uh of friends and stuff like that so mm. it varies yep. and one of them has already been released crashing down can you tell me a little bit about that yeah, that's uh, that's actually the last song that I wrote for the record and for the album, and uh, and uh, it's it kind of turned into kind of loosely based on the you know the last days of Hanoi and then surviving it and then going forward. That's pretty much what the song is about. And I got nasty suicide to play guitar on it. Michael came and played saxophone on it, and it was just a happy family affair. So yeah, I'm glad that came on. Yeah. Good. Speaking of nasty suicide, it's actually his birthday today, so we should wish him happy birthday. It's today? It is. I'm such a bad brother. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Well, I got to call him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, Nasty, if you're watching this, happy birthday from me and from Sammy as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All righty, cool. Yeah. So um, as far as Crashing Down goes, um, of course, we all know how Hanoi ended and what a tragedy it was. And um, we'll talk some more about specifics later. But um, do you feel like even, uh, do you feel like you're relatively at peace, though, with how it ended? Or do you feel like you're kind of back and forth and that you still feel some of the tragedy and frustrations that happened during that no, time? No, I've been at peace with it for a long time. It's, it's, uh, it, was, it was a horrible thing that happened and, uh, you know, but you can't really live your life dwelling on it. You have to move on and, you know, Russell's not here, you know, his memory is and he's with me in other ways, you know what I mean? But, but as far as getting over it, yeah, I've been over it for a long time. And do you feel like writing about it uh, really helps you keep perspective on it? Yeah, I never even thought about writing about it. And this came kind of just out of uh, just an accident in a flurry of writing a song. It was really weird. I didn't really sit down and, and go like, okay, I'm going to write a song about that. You know, it's just kind of like suddenly started taking me to that direction. And, and with that song, the lyrics changed quite a lot of times. And then I realized... Mm -hmm finally what it what's what it's all about and uh then i just went for it and, and wrote it that way and do you feel like when you write um you're very open in that way like a lot of what you're feeling just kind of comes out you don't really need to come at it with an agenda much of the time yeah it's it usually starts from just like jamming and and from an empty head mm -hmm. really an empty place kind of you know it's it's uh i rarely sit down and and uh and start writing a song because i want to write a certain kind of song it usually comes from jamming with myself and, you know, doing shit in my home studio. I have, you know, a home studio and I spend a lot of time in there. So there's a lot of stuff to 
go back to. So it's it's kind of the fun, the process is kind of fun that way because you just kind of get to have fun with the music and try different things and see what works. And, and then afterwards, you just kind of like, you know, gather your wits and, and, and do the editing and do the writing and, and put it together. Nice. All right, so it kind of sounds like you're able to work alone very effectively, but you're also able to kind of bring in an ensemble effectively. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, Nasty Suicide and Michael Monroe played on that track. Um, who are some of your other collaborators on the album? Well, this, uh, I started after my, the, the first live record that I had, uh, I put together a live band, and it's uh, Linda, uh, the guitar player from him, and Burton, the, the keyboard player from him, the Finns. They're excellent people. They are amazing musicians, and uh, they're good people to spend time in a band with. And and of course, the drummer Yanne, who's an old childhood friend of mine. We, when we both started on this trip of music, we started kind of together. We were like 13, 14 years old, and, and uh, just did a bunch of crazy stuff. And, and it's great to play with those guys. So that's the really the core of the band. It's it's those us four. And then I got this couple of songs which are. I kind of, I, I noticed that I tend to take something with me. I put something in my bag from all the bands that I, all the artists that I play with, you know, whether it's the the Dolls or the John Jett or, or Helicopters or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, on this record, I just wanted to, the rock songs to be kind of like really raw and garagey and not too poppy and not too polished. I want it just to be, it's just like in your face, very raw rock and roll and, and the two of the songs, Hurricane Hank and Shit Show, turned out like that. It, they're very, very helicopters, I admit it. And I thought, like, what's yeah. better than going over to Sweden and get Dragon to play guitar on it? So I got Dragon to play the other guitar on those two songs, which yeah. worked out perfectly. Excellent. And tell me what it's like playing with musicians that you've been with for quite a while versus working with newer musicians. I mean, is there a joy in finding new people to play with, or are you kind of at a point where you prefer to play with um, comrades that you've had for a while? Well, it's yeah. the Monroe band has been together in this form now for about 12 years. You know, it's, it's I mean, with Steve, we have a, our 20th, 20th anniversary coming up this year. I've been playing with Steve nonstop, Steve Hunting, for 20 yeah. years. And he still surprises me. He's, a, he's an incredible musician and writer, and he still comes up with new, you know, very incredible and interesting stuff. And, and he also now he's starting to play uh, parts of his lead with his magnificent notes, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, he actually plays a solo with his nose. It's, uh, it's amazing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought first. Oh my gosh, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, playing with that, you know, it's it's like the hymn guys, they come from a kind of totally different school of, you know, rock and roll. It's their stuff is more heavy kind of thing. And and, uh, and Burton, the keyboard player, is kind of all over the place. He's like, a, you know, synth maniac. And, and getting their kind of like outlook on how these songs could be put together live because I don't really want to put together a band that plays exactly the live record. It's, it's, I find it kind of uninteresting and uninspiring. So, so I just think that uh, playing with people that don't come from the same school of thought or music or whatever it is, is very healthy and, and, and giving and, and you learn a lot. Awesome. And as far as writing um, about kind of the political scene in the world, um, do you feel like that that does give you a lot of fire? I mean, as you pointed out, there's a huge conflict going on right now with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and now with the situation in, in Gaza. I mean, do you feel um, particularly compelled given how fraught the, um, basically how fraught the world is right now? Yeah, it's, I'm kind of old, so <laughs> it's a, it's uh i was around in the 70s when the world was much better and the same conflicts were actually happening then you know what is happening now and that's what i mean in the beginning it's just like watching the same rotten movie over and over again and i come from the school of punk rock and and about you know school of music should say something you know it shouldn't just be love songs about couples either get it getting together or or divorcing you know it's a uh, I think there's a big, huge world out there, and, and uh, 
And I always always been interested in what drives people, what drives humans in, you know, as individuals and as they get together as a stupid mass. <laughs> I just say it's just I've never ceased to it never ceases to amaze me like how freaking wrong we can actually go. But uh I think that partly writing about that it's it's good and healthy and it, it can be done in a way that it's interesting to listen to. I don't want to be some kind of a preacher for me or you know who's telling you that it goes like that, <laughs> you know. It's yeah. uh, like Bob Marley and all those people who actually talked about their, you know, real, their real life, but through beautiful music, you know, that's kind of like what I like about music, that you can do that. Exactly. And Marvin Gaye and John Lennon as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole slew of those great people. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's a way to talk about these issues in a poetic and enjoyable way without just kind of preaching to people like you were saying yeah. before. Yeah. I like to preach your stuff too, though, you know, in your face, fuck you, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. But yeah, I mean, and I can relate to what you were saying before. I mean, I'm I'm a woman living through the, who lived through the first Trump era, and now we were going through another election cycle with him too. So uh, it's very oh, stressful. But um, It's a mad, mad world out there. <laughs> that's for damn sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. Um, and what's it like for you? I mean, as an observer, as an observer of that. I mean, I know that you've li you lived in America for quite some time, but now you make your home in um, Spain and Finland, from what I understand. I mean, yeah. were you particularly surprised by how far right a lot of um, the American population and American politics went? Or yeah, how how divided and how it actually worked that division thing. You know, it's I lived in U.S. for twenty. 26 years or something like that for a long, long, long time. 30, hold on a second. I moved there in 87. I moved out in 2014. What does that make? Oh, um, math. <laughs> a long time. Exactly. Long, long time. And and I was just surprised that that somebody actually managed to, you know, to to put a wedge in there. You know, it's it's I mean, US is a very special place. And, kind of difficult country in order to try to you know, get a grasp on it. So there's so much and the history is pretty damn ugly, to be honest, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, I'm just into, I, it, it just really interests me that, that one guy, a billionaire from New York City, manages to rile up all the, all the not so well-to-do people from Midwest. <laughs> I'm not just baffled by it all. I'm just like, wow. But who knows? It's it's kind of interesting watching it from this side, and especially talking to to my friends in in US and and what their opinions are, and and it's it's uh, the reactions are from like huge disappointment into this kind of horror, to to this kind of like you know this is just a bad dream. It's going to pass soon. But. Uh, it's populism, you know, it raises its head everywhere and, and uh, kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. Being a dick and I, seems and to be like an okay thing to be nowadays. And uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, I just said that being a dick seems to be a normal thing to be like nowadays. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's and, it's, like and as far as my feelings, I mean, I've felt shock, I've felt horror, and kind of like you said, there's this horrible irony to the fact that a billionaire. Yeah elitist yeah. riled up the working classes in the yeah. way that he did and you know that he's just talking bullshit it's just his own agenda going he's not thinking one second about america yeah it's exactly. the own thing man it's just uh it's, yeah, bad yeah and um going off of that do you think that art could really have an effective role in making people see a better way or perhaps reflecting the uh, true horror and discontent that people feel because of things like Trumpism and Brexit and it, Ukraine and Hamas? Um, art can do little. It can bring together people and it can uh, make people think. But as far as like bigger moves or any bigger things in the history of the world, I don't think it's going it, to, it, it can't play that big of a part because it's the uh, the people with guns and money who are doing that 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's basically for opening people's heads and giving people perspective on other people. And, and uh, the one main thing is that uh, not to be so judgmental about your fellow human beings on this planet. It's, uh, it's, uh, it can do that. So tell me a little bit more about the album. Did you automatically start working on it after um, your previous solo effort? Yeah, I started thinking about it because the previous one got a pretty good reception and people seemed to like the kind of music that I do. And I was very, very happy and touched about that. I was just kind of like, it came as a surprise. You know, I just thought that I put together a record, this one record for myself, basically, that I do the kind of music that I love doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, which means that it's a hodgepodge of all kinds of styles. There's all kinds of music in there. And I, as I said, you know, I, I spent a lot of time just noodling around and with the home studio. And so I had a, about a hundred different ideas that could be formed into a song. And, and I just started like two years ago, the, the process of going through them and listening to that, this could be a song, this could not be a song, and then just kind of weeding them out and then narrowing it down to like 50 and then to 25. And then I went and recorded finally, I think 12 or 13 songs. And I and, uh, just wanted to do like a classic record of 10 songs on the record, five on side A, five on side B kind of thing. Yeah. And I think that people were really excited to hear it. I mean, you've been in so many bands before and now you're kind of showing us your, your individual gifts, you know? Yeah, it's fun. And um, as far as this album goes, uh, what is what is the exact release date? It's I think on March eighth or ninth, either one. Okay. <laughs> I think it's March ninth. Yeah. Okay. Is it going to be available on vinyl? Yes, it's going to be available in Finland through Valilla Music House, which is my label here, and the rest of the world is going to be on Cargo Records. Okay. So yeah, Cargo is the place where to get it if you're in the US. And um, are you planning on doing any shows? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm really busy with Michael right now too. We are, we're just finishing or we just actually got started on making a new album. And I just got back here to Spain to chill out a little bit just a few days ago. And and, uh, we got a bunch of stuff happening with Michael this year. And uh, I'm doing just a short tour in Finland now in, uh, in the spring and then another one in the fall. But maybe later on in the year or next year, I'm going to check out if I can do some shows abroad. Awesome. I know that a lot of U.S. fans would love to see you here. Yeah, that would be fun. I haven't been in the States since 2016, so it could be fun. Mm-hmm. There's actually yeah. a festival about to happen um, this June called the No Values Punk Festival, where a lot of bands are going to be playing. And um, Oh, and that's actually- the one. Yeah. That's, yeah. That lineup is insane. <laughs> I know. I thought it was fake when I saw it at first. Are I'm like, you kidding okay. Me? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I was like, this has got to be like an AI rendering. Like these are this is yeah. these great bands. But sure enough, it's real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But um anyway, I but at the same time I did look at it and I thought, you know what? It would be cool if like ha- Hanoi reunited and came to this too or something. Yeah. Say no more. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, but that's that, another can of worms. Well, I mean, it's a can of worms that got open last year at Michael's birthday, though. The original five members were able to reunite. And um, if I might say, it was, it was actually quite a nice show. Yeah, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It was brilliant. I think we all were walking like, uh, you know, three feet above the ground and <laughs> really enjoying the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I know that Andy has expressed interest in um, possibly doing some more work with the, with you guys. Do you think that's something that might come to fruition? Uh, there hasn't been any talk about that. It's it's. Uh, I think he said it after the after the gig, and he was just high from the gig or something. You know what I mean? It's uh, we we decided then when we did that this was going to be just a one off. You know what I mean? But I've never been the one to say never. You know, in my life, it's I notice that it's futile <laughs> you know things just go the way that they go and then suddenly you realize like oh shit why am i here with these guys again <laughs> you know yeah but uh it's it's uh it was a lot of fun man and especially getting the original drummer in there it, it was uh that was a treat and it's funny how like because we're very i mean it, it's over 40 years ago it's like talking about you know winter war or something you know it's 
it's uh but it, it was it's really weird when you get together you know with the same guys and the dynamics and and uh how people talk to each other and how they react to each other and what is camaraderie and all this kind of stuff it's 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 very funny you know it's mm -hmm. it's literally nothing has changed from when we were like 60 17 to we are 60. <laughs> just kind of pathetic i think <laughs> well if if i may say i think that's kind of a, a wonderful thing though i mean even yeah, if it, yeah. just looking at pictures of you guys now versus back then like i love comparing how you pretty much dress the same and yeah you know, and you you know we were like that when we started we didn't do things for fat you know for fashion shake you know that that we were in some kind of bandwagon you know that uh, or scene we kind of started the scene and, and uh it's just the way we are you know it's uh it's very weird nasty dress is very different nowadays but <laughs> it's i like it's some athletic sleeves kind of look here is going on <laughs> yeah now that you say that he is probably the one who does look aesthetically uh, uh, the most different now than he yeah. did then but yeah he went straight for a while <laughs> <laughs> yep and yeah. um, anyway, to um, back to Michael Monroe for a minute. I mean, you guys have been playing together for so long. Um, what do you think makes your partnership so satisfying and so wonderful? Uh, he's a good friend. You know, we've known each other since we were kids. And, and uh, when we lived in New York those years together in like 1990 till 95, mm -hmm. did like Demolition 23 and some other stuff. And, and uh we kind of like noticed then that that uh, the way that we want to do music is is very similar mm -hmm. you know it's, it's very kind of we like a little bit straighter punkier kind of edge to things and and uh and uh we just get along you know it's just a very simple thing and once we started doing because it's with demotion 23 it was kind of it felt like it never it, we didn't see it all the way through because you know there was accident with the original guitar player and then Michael moved away from New York and I got stuck over there and I mean stuck in New York and and we always felt like it was kind of unfinished business so when we met what was that in uh, 2008 or something like that we met in uh, in Turku which is now as Michael's hometown and we played there with the dolls and and uh, Michael came up and jammed some saxophone and played some harp and you know with us and, and then we just ended up spending the whole night jumping from one shit bar to another and just uh just thought like we should continue from them you know where demolition 23 left off we should continue from that idea mm -hmm. and that's what we kind of been doing about putting obviously a twist to it you know because there's different writers and different kinds of people and all that but mm -hmm. it's basically a continuum of that Mm -hmm. I know that you didn't want to focus uh, solely on the Hanoi stuff, but would you mind if I asked you? Um, no, let's just go for it. I just don't want to do the whole book on it. <laughs> okay, it's okay. It, it won't be the whole book. Um, so one thing that happened recently with Michael is that he actually uh, had a meeting with Vince Neil and the other members of Motley Crue. And um, from what I can see, it looked quite lovely, like a very forgiving, mm -hmm. peaceful moment. And um, with that said, one thing that was on my mind is how Andy and Nasty and you felt about it. Would you mind sharing that with us? Well, I don't know about Andy and Nasty, but I thought it was great. I was hoping that this would have happened like a long time ago because I, I made peace with Vince and the rest of the guys in late 80s when the Girls, Girls, Girls album came out. I went to the to the, uh, to the release party in, in Hollywood and just walked up to Vince and, you know, I, it, it turned into a very, uh, very uh, intense moment, and and uh, yeah, it hasn't been easy for him either. So I I made peace. I I didn't want to be in any kind of a negative thing about you know about things that happened with them together. You know, I mean, it wasn't like. You know, it, it was a horrible, sad accident, and then my brother died, and and uh, but uh, I had to make peace with it. You know, it's, there's no other way of being. It's it's uh, to be yeah. I couldn't live with myself if it was inside of like inside it's all hurt and anger and and that kind of thing. So yeah, I thought it was just positive thing that he went and talked to him. You know, good. That's wonderful. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and I and I hope that's how the other two felt as well. Yeah, well, Andy, you never know. 
<laughs> yeah, Andy said some stuff to me that's actually appeared on other YouTube channels, and it was not flattering to Vince. But yeah, um, I know, but that's how he is. You know, his his uh, negative mouth. Uh, he thinks that he gets a lot of press because of it. That's just his mind. You know. Yeah. Well, All the press is good press. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, it's whatever, whatever I think of that. I mean, I think that his work is good enough press it, as can be. Like, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Exactly. Let your songs talk. You know what yeah. I mean? He just keeps putting his shoe in his mouth all the time. But it's the way he is. Yeah. It's, and, yeah. and with that said, I mean, I genuinely, when, I, when I've spoken with Andy, he, he can be very lovely. And I, and I think the world of his talent, I. Oh, well, sure. Crazy. He can be very lovely. Yeah, and yeah. I I wish him nothing but the best. You know, I I wish that he were yeah. as proactive as you are about his career, and that he were focusing on that rather than kind of the the negative kind of the negative uh, comments. Uh, that I've heard. He's doing what he's doing. He's painting a lot, you know, and it's, it's uh, I think it, he gets bored with you know doing music nowadays and okay. the way that the business is and all that. He loves playing. I know that for a fact, you know. But I think he's kind of like. I think he's fine with what he's doing now. There's, it's uh, he has his own weird way of being. You know, it's a, it's a very peculiar kind of guy. You know, you can't really compare him to anything. It's just, it's just him. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah, I hope I he's doing well. You know, I think he's doing all right. Good, good. As Dave Tregana would say, he lives on Planet Andy. Yes, he does. Exactly. He's maybe even past the planet Andy. I think he's already <laughs> headed to some other fucking planet. <laughs> okay. Well, um, going off of what you said, Andy has um, has embarked on a painting career as well, but you've also uh, dipped into other avenues. Um, don't you do a pottery business with your wife? Yeah. I don't want to call it a business. It's just kind of like uh, during the COVID thing, we just got you know find something to do and and we ran into a couple of you know beautiful people who are who do it for a living you know who really are in pottery business and amazing artists and, and we just went and hung out with them for a while and got sucked into the world of clay and colors and and uh we just started doing that and you know and, and mary came up with this amazing ceramic tits was so fucking brilliant it was a yeah she's a genius and uh, i started doing of course something really difficult which is a non-symmetric giant tray where the uh, survival percent was i think at 1.20 percent and i was just like what the fuck am i doing this for you know it's out of the 10 eight breaks and two is you know survives but uh, we, we've been doing it on and off. My wife has been doing a little bit more than I because I've been doing my radio shows and TV programs and a couple of bands and all that at the same time. So I haven't had that much time for ceramics lately, but I need to get back into that again. Yeah, it kind of sounds like your creativity takes a lot of different forms. I mean, even when you're in a situation like COVID where you've got to spend more time alone, you still find a way to to basically flex your creative muscle you know what i mean yeah yeah i think it's healthy for everybody it's uh when you're bored instead of you know staring at some tv series or something do something you know create your own do something you know it's just whatever the creativity is it can be cooking or it can be brewing your own whiskey in your cellar you know what i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> just get creative exactly and yeah. um, you, you were talking about your wife before. Um, from what I understand, she's a photographer. And um, is it fun being able to share um, to share that with her? Yeah, I mean, she's a photojournalist. You know, it's like uh, pretty heavy places and 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 subject matter that she's been working on. So her work, you know, I'm like a pussycat, you know, compared to what she does. And and uh, she's an inspiration in every possible way. It's it's. Uh, She's one of those who goes and does, you know what I mean? She creates her own work and uh, she's an amazing photographer and I shamelessly exploit her for my album covers every time when I can. And, <laughs> and she photographs you very says, well. yes. yeah. huh? She does a wonderful job photographing you, by the way. She oh, yeah, did yeah, your yeah, previous she's... album, correct? Yes, absolutely. And the book cover and everything. Yeah. yeah. 
and um as and it was was and again you remarried uh quite recently from what i understand i think you're about to have a, your eighth wedding anniversary um was that did it feel like a new era for you i mean was that kind of invigorating having a new partner to to share all of your ventures with yeah and it's kind of it's, i had moved away from us i moved back to europe because i uh I moved to US when I was 24 and, and I moved back to to Finland to or to Europe in when I was 51. So mm -hmm. it definitely was kind of like and I had kind of missed Europe a lot, you know, during my stay in, in US and and uh, you know I, I love being in US and especially New York was just amazing. But uh but it was time to kind of come home and this is where my roots are and my mom and dad was getting old and I wanted to be close to them and, you know, and, and see them through, you know, and be whatever help I can be to them, you know, and uh, it was a necessary thing to do. And then out of the blue, when, you know, you don't want to have a relationship, you know, the person walks in front of you and oh, there it is. And I'm like, fuck, here we go again. <laughs> but this time it's like it seems to be very 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 amazing nice yeah and do you think that you're going to stay in europe now for the long haul or can you see can you see the two of you maybe living in the u.s what does the future hold no i think we we here i think so nice yeah. And on another Hanoi Rocks related thing, um, you actually wound up naming your son after Razzle. Um, do you still get compliments about uh, the name Nicholas? No, nobody really knows about that. So, you know, it's it's not like I'm in. Yeah, yeah, I named him after Razzle. You know, it's, it's, uh, it happened around, you know, it's kind of like tied together. And, and uh, Nicholas is a great name. It is. Yeah. yeah. It's a lovely tribute. Yeah. All right, so back to your current album. Um, do you have any favorite tracks on it? I keep listening to it. Uh, and I like them all, I have to say. There's not one that I don't like, which is Victory. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, uh, well, you always end up because making records is kind of a, a long, big trip. And some of your babies turn out the way that you expected them. And some of them surprises you completely. And that some of them, that you thought was going to be great didn't turn out that great. But you know, I really, I really dig this record, and, and I listened to the old one, the old one, the, the first one, a couple of years ago, and uh, I mean, it's it's a decent record too. I really like it. I mean, you know, you always find things that you would do differently now, but then again, that's the that's the that's the evidence of the time where I was. You know what I mean? And, uh, same thing with this. Next album, I don't know what I'm going to do. I might do a country record, just like Beyonce. Who knows? <laughs> and um, I'm kind of curious, like, do you find yourself being, um, how do you find the right level of being self-critical enough, but not too self-critical to prevent your work from coming out? Well, you need to give a shit a lot, and then you don't, then you need not to give a shit at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, I'm a Virgo, so I'm a, for certain things, I, I zone it very intensely, but then at the same time, I want to keep things loose and I want the whole picture to be different. I don't want to be very anal about, you know, with the greens and everything is in time and nothing speeds up or slows down. I like uh, music that breathes and it goes with the players. I uh, From the old school, I don't like, uh, you know, greedy music too much. Yeah, one artist too, I think is wonderful, but I think that her creative process is veers towards fanatically um, perfectionist is Courtney Love. Um, have you heard any of her recent work? No. But yeah, like she'll kind of delay albums by like a decade sometimes because she's so picky about what she wants out and stuff like that. I mean, I feel like you have kind of a good balance of wanting your work to be well done, but also understanding that sometimes you got to yeah. let it out there and help and hope that people like it. I like the first one that Kim Gordon and, and uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, Eric Erlinson. First and more, they they produced they produced the first one, Pretty is for You. Or, no, what was it called? Pretty on the Pretty. inside. Huh? Pretty on the yeah. inside. Pretty is for You was the Alice Cooper's first one. Pretty on the inside. Yeah, I remember listening to that record. That was a trippy one. Wow. I like that. 
Yeah, nice. I haven't um, really listened to Courtney's stuff, you know, for a while. Um, that kind of begs another question. Um, that I mean, that's kind of an early uh, grunge album. Were you a big fan of uh, of Hole and other grunge bands as they started to gain prominence? Not really. I mean, I like that record. I like Sonic Youth a lot, but that's not really grunge, is it? You know what I mean? And uh, Nirvana did. I mean, Kurt Cobain was, you know, one of a kind. That was amazing. But the other stuff, not so much. It, it just didn't tickle my bone in any way. Not the funny bone or the serious bone. It was just, uh, yeah, it, was, it, it took itself a little too seriously, I think, somehow. It's just, yeah. Wow. Okay. But um, anyway, I was going to say, too, like even throughout um, kind of the Seattle sound and the grunge era, you remained like very, very much the same musically and very true to yourself. I mean, was there any pressure to make Jerusalem Slim or Demolition 23 more like the Seattle sound or um, just describe it for me? Were you guys res resistant to that? No, we didn't really have any interference from the record label point of view and, and uh First of all, Michael would never go for the flannel shirts. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I know we didn't, it's, it's Michael's Michael, you know what I mean? And uh, I don't like the Jerusalem Slim record one bit. I, I think it's the worst record that I have ever been involved with. And, uh, but the Demolition 23, it comes down to keeping, Things simple and having you know uh, great catchy songs and, and with with lyrics that say something. So, in my book, maybe we were, we were a little bit grunge, but <laughs> maybe not. Okay. Old school punks, you know, it's going to change an old punk. I don't know, grunge is going to change that. Okay. Now you mentioned Sonic Youth before, um, and you've kind of referenced Sonic Youth a couple of times throughout your career. Um, wh what is it about their sound that you like, and um, how do you think your music reflects that? Uh, they were kind of fearless, you know. They they decided to do something completely new, what hadn't been really done in pop format with uh, with guitars, and uh, it's uh, I like that, you know, that that they they combined that insanity that they have with like really amazing songs at the same time. So I saw them live quite a few times in one and uh, they are forced to reckon with. Amazing band. Nice. Yeah. And um, back to this album, uh, who are some other people who are playing on it uh, that we would know about? It's just uh, what I told you, it's, it's uh, my band and then Nasty and Drake and Michael, that's it. I kept my guests kind of limited this time. Okay. I just didn't have, you know, because I thought the first one, I didn't have a guitar player, you know, it's, it's I didn't have a band together. So it, it was a totally different trip. You know, I asked, I asked a bunch of my friends if they could contribute a good guitar track and to this. And that, uh, this time now I had a band, so it was kind of easier, the whole thing. Okay. So it was kind of a family project in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, I'm kind of curious what your plans are for the future. I mean, do you have any goals that we don't know about yet or whether it's writing, music, anything else? Well, I just, I'm building a little studio here. I'm getting kind of into doing that kind of stuff. And uh, and also it's a painting studio so I can paint and do other kinds of stuff. And, and uh, you know, the music is going to keep going. I'm doing a bunch of TV. I'm doing, I've been doing radio in Finland now for, four or five years, like every summer, there's a 10 to 12 episode special and, and uh, also fun to make. So if there's any US stations that want to hire me, I speak excellent English. What? Hear that US stations? You should hire Semi Alpha. We would yeah, listen. I'm right, man. Yeah. And so the future is open. I mean, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's, uh, I started doing, uh, Acoustic gigs with just me and the guitar and storytelling kind of thing, you know, where I play the whole, my roots from where I started until today, pretty much songs from every band that I've been in, from Hanoi and Demolition and Michael and Joan Jett, New York Dolls and, you know, Pella Miliona and all this kind of stuff. And those have been great gigs. They have been one of the best time I've had for a long time. So I'm going to continue doing that. 
that kind of begs one question for me. Um, is there one band in particular that you think that you were at your creative best with? Like you did some of your best work and you felt very confident about yourself. Can you name one? Uh, uh, that's a hard question. <laughs> I feel I'm in a very good place now. But uh, then also when we did the Dolls records, those were a lot of fun, even though they were just shambolic and, and uh, it was both, they, they had very different kind of creative processes, but both of them were a lot of fun to do. And, and uh, Michael's couple of first ones were very, very interesting to make. And, and, uh, and this last one, I think is gonna be a good one. So I don't know. And then all the Hanoi stuff, I mean, uh, you know, Barely remember it, but that was just kind of like fucking, you know, teenagers just go for it and take a lot of amphetamine and play rock and roll and be obnoxious. That's what it was all about. And thank God we had a great songwriter. And yep. if we didn't have him, <laughs> yep. Well, one one thing I wanted to ask you about too is um the influence that Hanoi has had. I mean, it's been so far reaching. You've influenced everyone from Guns N' Roses to Alice in Chains. And I'm wondering if there was one person or one band that approached you and told you what Hanoi meant to them. And just tell me a touching experience about um, about someone having come up to you and said, thank you for your influence on me. Uh, well, Alejandro Escobedo. Do you know who that is, Alejandro Escobedo? Look him oh, up. That? Yeah, look him up. It's it's uh he's, he's I think he's an American treasure, and uh, he played in the Nuns, which was San Francisco punk band in the uh, seventies. Open up for the Sex Pistols, and you know he's a he's a Latino American singer songwriter, incredible writer, and uh, he's a dear friend as well. And and when he mentioned that uh, we had meant a lot to him. That meant a lot to me. Aw, nice. Yeah, Alejandro. You know, um, your late friend Timo Calcio actually told me kind of a cool story as well. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to know if you could kind of share your memories of it here. Um, when you were playing with Hanoi um, on your US tour, there was a young man who came to your Boston show, I believe, and um, helped Timo with uh, Andy's guitars in exchange for a ticket and backstage pass. and. Um, do you remember who the, that young man was? Yeah, I heard that it was easy, but I didn't meet him then. It's oh, I yeah. saw his letters that he had sent to our, uh, you know, band's office in London. You know, that we started getting these letters from uh, because Izzy was a really weird name for us. It was like, what Izzy? What is that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I remember those letters, you know, where he said that he's a fan and he loves the stuff that we do and all that. But I don't remember meeting him. I met him later when I moved to LA in 87, like three years after that. Okay. Met him and then we hung out a bit and, you know, considered him a friend for a while. But I haven't heard from him for a long time. A lot of people haven't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was kind of a kind of a private person, but um, do you yeah. still have the letters that he sent to Hanoi? No, they went to our uh, band's office, Hanoi Roxy's office the management office, so I didn't take him. I, I don't say anything. I have, I barely have my own records, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, I'm, I'm not a collector. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, going off of the other story, has there been a time when you've met one musician who meant a lot to you and you liked being able to tell them just thank you for the music and the influence that they had on you? Yeah, there's, there's a whole slew of them. My playing in the dolls was was just what was just crazy, <laughs> you know. To play with Sylvain and David was nuts, and then I had played in the uh, in late eighties. I had played with uh, with, with uh, Jerry Nolan and, and Johnny Thunders as well. So I got to play with all of the the dolls, you know, one time or the other, and and uh, I got to play with Walter Lore from Heartbreakers and. You know, I got to jam with Cheetah Chrome and I got to jam with uh, Steve Baders and, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I became friends with Didi Ramon. And, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was somehow like some of my absolute teenage, you know, little Sammy from nowhere, Finland, you know, little punk rocker and suddenly I'm playing with those guys and hanging out was just like pretty freaking cool. Yeah. 
exactly. Did you see the yeah. recent documentary about uh, David Johansson that uh, Martin oh, I haven't Scorsese? seen that yet. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. I, mean, it's, I heard that I have a couple of songs in there that I wrote with him. So, yeah, it's wonderful. It, it's really great. I think it's on um, on uh, the Showtime channel here in America. Oh, right on. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, anything else that you'd like to add about the album? Uh, it ha probably has the best cover in the history of rock and roll. <laughs> Tell me about it's, it. Uh, well, it's it's uh you know when I came up with the title with the Satan's Helpers, Wall Lays Arise, and the Money Pick Circus, I thought like, well, how the fuck am I gonna first of all fit all that into an album, and how am I gonna make it look or make it seem like it's not so heavy as the title kind of suggests? And, mm -hmm. and then I just started thinking about all those old uh, movie posters of you know the spaghetti westerns and. 1960s French movies and, and and Turkish movies from the 70s, those really overblown kind of uh, poster kind of vibe. And, and I, I did a photo shoot with my wife and uh, came up with a few characters, you know, and, and, uh, and then we sent the photos to Rich Jones, my uh, Michael's guitar player, and, and sent a couple of, you know, reference posters, you know, by the mail and all the photos and and he just said like oh this is right up my alley and he literally sent me the album cover as it is like maybe four days later it was just like he just asked something like this is this too much and i just said like no it's this is it you did it it's it's done and yeah rich is a genius yeah so like, and one yeah. thing that i think shines through on this is your sense of humor and how much you and how much you're able to laugh and enjoy yourself you know yeah, without that life is nothing. Exactly. Is it? Yeah. yeah. We're here such a short time, man. You know, it's just like, <laughs> better fucking enjoy it while you can. <laughs> it sounds like you are. I mean, you reached your 60th birthday, and it sounds like you're more active and happy than ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Look on wood. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Alrighty, cool. So, anything else you wanted to add? No, I don't know. I think uh, Bubble here is ready to have her dinner. It's about that time. That's what she started to whining and grinding here. Okay. The bone. She's but, adorable, by uh, the way. I'm so it's, glad that it's, she... uh, music is a is a blessing, and and uh, people complain and say that there's not a great music coming out nowadays. Blah blah blah. But I say fuck that. There is a lot of a lot of great music coming out. It just takes some digging. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah. the the, ma the major labels and the major forces that are out there. They are not putting out any any good music, but they haven't really put out good music for a long time. You know, it's just money driven slobber. You know, it's it's uh it's uh, you have to find the good music and and as much as I hate Spotify for their business model, it is uh, basically a genius thing to exist. So get your fucking business together and start paying <laughs> but then they cannot be it's a it's a fucked up situation kind of you know yeah and from what you were saying before there is a frustration when i hear people say say that too about how there's no good music anymore there really is but is. unfortunately a lot of it has not been embraced by um by the mainstream and it doesn't yeah. get the promotion that i feel that it deserves i mean do you feel like there is a way to make a rock band, for instance, as popular as Beyonce or Taylor Swift again? Sure. It just has to be a good one. There hasn't been a good one lately. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, you know, kids come up with uh, the damnest things and, and uh, you know, hopefully some group of kids comes up with something really fresh and beautiful and, and, uh, and unique. You know, yeah. it's it's uh it's it's kind of a time of a rehash. Also, you know, everybody's kind of doing this '60s trip or that '70s trip or that goth trip or that trip, and you know, it's it's the hard thing is 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 trying to find somebody with, with true personality and and imagination and execution. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, and along that line, there was one band in the past couple of years that people were saying might be the next popular rock band, and it was called Greta Van Fleet, and. I listened to them and 
I like some of their stuff, but it's so obviously a carbon copy of Led Zeppelin. And when I hear them, I think, look, guys, I want another great rock band, but we can't just do a copy of Led Zeppelin it's, or the Rolling Stones or no, whatever. it's like the chipmunks doing Led Zeppelin, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a, yeah, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, you know, it's it's nice that there's guys doing rock and roll. I mean, that that's kind of like where the desperation lies nowadays, that... Oh wow, there's people playing guitars instead of a laptop. You know, it's it yeah. seems to be kind of like the, you know, that's good enough, but it's not. Yeah. You know I mean, guitars yeah. are magnificent noisemakers and instruments, and and uh, they can uh, project your feelings and stuff like that. So hopefully, there will be something that is their own trip. That's why I like Sonic Youth. They did something completely own. And Chains Addiction. Those are my two favorites rock bands. Sonic Youth and what else, sorry? Jane's Addiction. Jane's Addiction, yes. Yeah, but that just shows my age. You know what I mean? I don't think there's been much good after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I think what, what you said before is key, though. It needs to, I think we need a rock band with their own personality and their own take on modern music and yeah. kind of a way to talk about issues without hammering it in too hard. Just there's a way to... I think there's a rock band out there, there that's going to do it, but I don't think it's going to be what we were talking about before, like a copy of Led Zeppelin or the Stones yeah. that sounds like Chipmunks doing them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, listen to our records. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Right. And, yeah. And um, as far as like uh, music that you've seen come out of Finland recently, I mean, are there any good uh, new Finnish bands that uh, that you've seen that you could suggest to us? Uh, now you put a hard one. Finland's kind of like in the same kind of situation the rest of the world. It's it's like the, the major labels are kind of ruling the airwaves and, and whatever waves. And uh, and that stuff is pretty like just thinking about marketing. So okay. but there's a there is uh kind of underground scene brewing here with with a lot of you know different kinds of bands but uh because i'm doing so much myself i rarely get to go out anymore you know it's like uh i don't run in the clubs anymore looking for new bands and stuff like that because i just simply don't have time or you know yeah. energy <laughs> But when you do that, I'm, I bet it's a major gift to them. They're probably like, oh, my God, it's Sammy Yoffa. <laughs> I know about that. <laughs> yes, I, I think that would be true. I know that if you walked into a place in Los Angeles, like, it would be like the king arrived or something. It, oh, it come on now. It's Papu. If Papu came over there, it would be like, who's that? <laughs> uh, Snoop Dogg. Aw. <laughs> Yeah, she needs food. It's your it's our dinner time. Okay. All yeah. right. So we should probably be be signing off then. And and thanks sure. for and Papu is actually really adorable. I'm glad he was part of the interview. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, cool. So people. um anything else you wanted to add? Mm, I just, you know, peace and love everybody and you know, take care of each other. And thanks for this. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. And it's been such a delight talking to you. Ah, oh, right on. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sammy. Bye. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.